6. We're going to be in 10 through 13. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Today we start a series about the armor of God. I have talked to you about this several times. This is very important. Satan does not like it. We're going to preface it with Satan's attack on the church. Most Christians today are being attacked so badly, but a lot of it is unnecessary simply because we don't follow Scripture. The Lord tells us through the writing of the Apostle Paul that we are to stand strong, we are to resist the devil and he will flee from us. We are to put on the armor of God to help shield us from the fiery darts of Satan. And we're going to break each piece down. We're going to really jump into this. It's going to take many weeks to do this. Satan does not like it. You're going to find out that as we start this, a lot of things are going to happen. Some things have already started happening this week as we were preparing for this. There's a lot of things that need unspoken prayer requests. But we simply need to, to start following Scripture. But let's get started in 6, 10. Finally, my brother, Paul is a typical Baptist preacher. He says finally, and then he preaches another sermon. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand. Father, I pray right now that you would hide us all behind the cross. We plead the blood of your precious Son, Jesus, over all of us, over this church. Father, I pray that you would open our ears, touch our hearts, help us to see what you're trying to tell us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Christian is described in chapters 1 through 3, and Paul really gets into that as to what we have in Christ, who we are in Christ. And then chapters 4 through 6, he tells us how to live it out. How that we are to live as a Christian. And part of this, you know, he tells us to walk the worthy walk. And to be kind one to another and love one another. And he goes, goes all, all through this and he says that we're to walk carefully, circumspectly. We're not to walk as fools, but we're to redeem, him, to redeem the time because the days are evil. We are to do all of these things. And then now he says... Put on the whole armor of God. How many of us put on the whole armor of God every day? A lot of times we just jump up, we run in there, we make the coffee, we do everything, we hurry up, eat the breakfast, and run out the door to get to work so that we're not five minutes late again. Amen? And we forget all about prayer, we forget all about scripture reading and doing all that, but get up 30 minutes early, read a couple verses of scripture, pray and ask God to help you through the day. Put on the he said we put on the armor of God so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. We can't stand against the wiles of the devil, bless God, because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. We're to walk wisely. We're to walk circumspectly. But we don't do it. And I told you one of the ploys of the devil is to keep you so busy that you don't see what's going on. Look at our world. 
so many distractions, so many things, so that we really don't see what is going on. The prime example with this virus and everything that's going on. But I do want to tell you this, when God begins to bless, Satan begins to attack. When Jesus began his ministry, what happened? The Spirit led him into the wilderness, and he fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. But while he was there, Satan came and tempted him three times. And then three times, he replied with Scripture. We can't reply with Scripture because we don't know Scripture because we fail to read our Bible, we refuse to read our Bible, and we don't want nothing of that, but we want to come to church and say, oh, we're a Christian. And then we get attacked. Paul told the Christians of Corinth that he was determined to stay a little while in Ephesus because a wide door of effective service has been opened to him, and he said, there are many adversaries. A lot of churches end up with pastors that have just left because there's difficulty, and the pastors don't stand up to the difficulty or the pressure or the satanic opposition, and they leave hoping and thinking that the other, the other field that they're going to is greater pastors. Now, if God tells you to leave, then that's what you need to do. But if he don't tell you to leave, you don't leave. You stay and you endure it. Man, when I was at Pleasant Grove, I wanted to leave. After the first Wednesday night, I was there. It was the first uh, business meeting. I was, that was my first church, first time, just fresh out of seminary and everything. So what do I do? I go in and we start... You know, we had to take parliamentary procedure, Robert's Rules of Order and all that, and this was my first time, so I called the meeting order. What do they do? The first thing we do business, we move, we fire all the deacons, the clerk, the treasurer, everybody. Split the church right down the middle. And then it was like running through a fire with gasoline shorts on ever since. But God bless. We stood up to the opposition. And that's what we've got to do here. Everywhere we go, folks, we've got to stand up to the opposition. Even the angels faced opposition. Daniel prayed in, in Daniel chapter 9, and he was holding an answer. And Michael finally got to him and said, man, here's your answer right here. God heard you the minute you prayed. And he sent me with the answer, but he said, I had to fight with the prince of Persia, with demons, because they were opposing me from bringing the answer to you. A lot of times we pray and we don't get an answer. Why? Is it because God doesn't hear? No, God hears us. But sometimes there's demonic opposition keeping that answer from coming to you. That's why we got to keep on and bombard heaven and not give up. But how many times do we give up just because there's a little opposition? Paul told the Thessalonians that he wanted to come to them. But Satan thwarted him. Satan hindered him. Believers will be attacked personally and corporately as a church. Paul warned the elders at Ephesus. He says, at my departure, grievous wolves, savage wolves are going to come in. Not sparing the flock. And they're going to try to tear you up. And there are going to be some that are even among you, some that are going to spring up right out from you, and they're going to do perverse things, and they're going to speak perverse things. And they're going to try to draw you away as disciples after them. Satan is going to attack us from within and from without. We are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. We are to learn Satan's devices. When you go to a new job and you're having to work on a machine or something like that, what do you do? You learn that machine. Some of you like sewing, and you get a new sewing machine, and it ain't like the old sewing machine, and you like going back to the old sewing machine. Why? Because you know it. 
But that new sewing machine, in order to work that thing properly, you have to learn it. When you get a new vehicle, all these new gadgets, you have to learn it. It's not like the old vehicle. It's got new things, and you have to learn it. And that's what we got to do with Satan. We've got to study the Scripture. We've got to learn the Scripture to learn his ways and how he operates. But the thing is, he wants us to stay so busy that we ain't got time to fool with that. And that's what we even say. I ain't got time. Uh, you know, I, I got I to go do this. I, gotta, I ain't got time to fool with that. You know. Now, am I right? And we got to study the scripture. We got to read the scripture. We got to learn the scripture. Hey Amen. You can get Bible apps on your phone. You can get Bible in headsets. You can download the Bible. You can do everything. Man, we live in the age of technology. There are iPhones. There are, what's the other phone? Droid, Android. You can get all kinds of droids. You know, you can get robots to do all this stuff for you. Just tell your phone, download the Bible app, and it'll download it. You know? You have no excuse not to read the Bible. But we do. Why? Because we stay so busy. Satan wants us to stay busy so that he can keep us from learning about him. What do you do if you don't want somebody to see what you're doing over here? You create a diversion over here, right? When Dad worked at the Correctional place there at Lancaster there in Trent. He said a lot of times the boys would stage something over here to keep you from seeing what was going on over here. Brian will tell you. Brian was there. Frankie will tell you. They'll stage something in the dorm down here to do something down here. And down here is something they're doing is always wicked to keep you. And they're doing something over here to, to, to divert your attention so that they can carry out their wickedness. What do you think Satan does? He'll start something over here so that you focus over here so that he can carry out his wickedness over there. <coughs> but we're not to be ignorant of his devices. Now, we're going to divert from Ephesians here just a moment. We're going to go over to Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to see in these churches, and I touched on this some months ago, but you'll see the progression of worldliness, satanic attack, and all of that in the seven churches because the seven churches represents different time periods in history. And you're going to see in each church segment how Satan attacks. The first one is the church at Ephesus. He said, man, I know you work. You're working hard. you got all kinds of things. I know your deeds. And you hate the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And you, you, those that say they are apostles that are not, you tell them about it. And you don't allow them to come in. And doctrinally, you're sound. But you have left your first love. They were enduring hardship for Christ. The word there is hukamone. It means that you have a big load has been placed on you. You're trying, you're spraying to try to get that load from one place to another. He said, I know that you're doing all this and you're going through emotions and you're carrying out all this, but you have left your first love. Leaving your first love always gives Satan a foothold. Do you hear me? Leaving Christ as your first love always gives Satan a foothold. It's always the beginning of the end result. When the thrill is gone and you start losing your love, that's when the attack comes. You can be orthodox, you can be fundamental, you can be doctrinally sound. You can go through the motions and you can think that you're okay. But you really need to check and find out. They thought they were okay. We ain't got no time for that. They thought they were fine. But Jesus said, I see. And you remember the vision.
vision of Jesus in chapter 1 of Revelation. He had those fiery eyes. He said, I see everything that's going on. And then a couple of verses down from that, when he gives a description, he said, I'm walking in and out of the churches, and I see, I know what's going on, and you have left your first love, Ephesus. Ephesus had lost their first love. They took their eyes off Jesus, going through the motions, working for Jesus. Do you know that you can be orthodox, you can be doctrinally sound, you can be doing all the right stuff, working for Jesus, and not love Jesus? That's the problem. We need to fall back in love with Jesus, folks. What about when you were dating your sweetie? Oh, man, you was eating her up, you was eating him up. You didn't have enough time in the day to spend with them. You were praying to God, Lord, let there be 26 hours in the day instead of 24 so I can be with soul so Because I just love them to death. Then you get married, and then you go to work, and you start doing all these things and everything, and then next thing you know, the honeymoon's over. You lost your first love. Folks, that's what's happening with the churches today. That's what's happening with the world today. We've lost our first love. We got to get back to loving Jesus. When we start getting back to loving Jesus, everything will be okay. Man, when we started back church a couple weeks ago, this place should have been full. People that say they're Christians and say they love Jesus, and they ain't even here. They should have been calling me and calling you, hey, when we starting church back? All through that two-month period when we didn't have no church. I couldn't stand it. I had to come. There was a couple of you came with me and we prayed. But I had to be here. Not that I'm trying to be somebody spiritual. But I love Jesus, y'all. With every fiber of my being, and I want to be in God's house. He says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. I want to be here in God's house because this is where I worship my Lord. But when God's house is not a priority, when you don't love Jesus like you need to love Jesus, guess what? God's house and the things of God are down about the 10th and 12th place. Because we're selfish, because we put ourselves on the throne, and I want this for me. You know, it used to be the excuse, well, the kids have got to go to school. What a kid, school's been out for three months, y'all, two, two and a half months. What's the excuse now? You ain't got to put them to bed early. They ain't been to school. But yet you still won't come to God's house. You still say that you love Jesus. You still say that you're a Christian. And when he tells us that we're not to forsake the assembly of ourselves, we do it. Because we have this, we got to go here, we got to go there, we got to work, we got to do this, we got to do that. Am I being truthful? I'm talking to you from the heart. And God's burdened me down with it. He has. And I, I told you before, and I'm going to say it again. God wants to do something spectacular with Mount Perrin Baptist Church. He has shown me that time and time again. But nothing's going to happen when we just go through the motions. Hey, you, you think this last two months, two and a half months has been bad? It's fixing to get worse. We're living in the last days, y'all. And it, there's going to be a fine line drawn. And if you love Jesus, you're going to be over here. And he's calling out the ones that are just playing the game. We're fixing to see who really loves Jesus. Some of us may lose our life because we love Jesus. Do you understand that? You think I'm playing. Start digging. Don't watch the news. You know, all of the TV channels, the news networks, all that, they're owned by just a couple of corporations, and they are demonic. And they're not telling you the news. You start digging for the real news. You'll see what the real news is, human trafficking. These Satan worshipers, they're 
sacrificing babies and drinking their blood and eating their flesh. And I know that's crude and, and, and gory and all that, but folks, it's the truth. That's what they're doing. Start digging on your own. You'll find out. And folks, we're coming down to the end of time now. These are exciting days. And we're going to see who really loves Jesus. We're going to find out. You know, over in China, if you say you're a Christian, and they find out, guess what? They kill you. Some of these Islamic people, you saw the news thing where they took them out on the beach and said, if you profess Christ, we're going to chop your head off. And that's what they did. And folks, it's coming to America. And we are asleep. We have been long asleep for the last 20, 30 years. We've got to wake up. Do you love Jesus? Amen. Ephesus had lost their first love. Paul went there. He spent three and a half years there. He fought with the demons. They had such a revival that they brought all of their satanic books in the middle of the, the street there and they burned them. They had the temple of Diana there or Artemis, whatever you want to call it. The Romans said Artemis, the Greeks said Diana. But it was a pagan temple. All they would do there is go and have drunken feasts and orgies and all this kind of stuff. They had men and women prostitutes. And they did all kind of demonic stuff. But Paul went in there and he started preaching the word of God. People were getting saved. And they had such a revival that all this stuff was going on. And they was burning their books and stuff. But they at one time were hot for Jesus. But they lost their first love. And right after the New Testament times in the first, second century... Because God said in Revelation, you, you better repent or I'm going to remove you. I'm going to remove your candlestick. And guess what? He removed his candlestick or their candlestick. What is that, preacher? They removed their church. There was no church no more after that. After about the first hour, I don't remember the exact time. But there... Off the GMC, the Keister River, all that smut and soot and stuff kept growing up, growing up, growing up. And it just kind of took over. And they moved it back some and moved it back some. But guess what? They lost their church. We used to be on fire for Jesus. We used to, back in the day, y'all keep telling me back when Brother Ed first came here, back when Brother Ed did this. And that's fine and great. What about right now? What are you doing? We're just, yeah, we're just sitting here doing nothing. Well, we paid a preacher. Well, that's great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Because I need to pay my bills. But the attitude now has been, and it's not just this church, it's all churches. When we pay the preacher, let the preacher and the deacons do it. And that's what we're doing. We're letting the preacher and the deacons do it. Well, half the deacons can't do it anymore. I can't do everything. So guess what? That means you got to start doing some things. you got to make some phone calls. you got to start inviting people to church. you got to start telling people about Jesus. you got to get on fire for Jesus. And when you get on fire for Jesus, guess what? God just kind of works things out, don't he? You got problems? Give them to Jesus. Some of you right now, if I were to talk about your problems, it would just, oh boy, because you are weighted down. Some of you have told me about some of them. And I'm praying for you. But get on fire for Jesus. He'll take care of you. There is such a demonic attack on the churches and on Christians. You're going to see a lot more. It's going to get worse. Y'all ain't never seen me come down out of the pulpit and preach hands. Does it make you nervous? Kind of makes me nervous, but I'm doing it. You know what? Hey, girl. Hey, girl. We got to get on fire for Jesus, y'all. Are you on fire for Jesus? 
We got to get on fire for Jesus. Hey, Brother Stan. Brother Lonnie. Brother Mike. Mr. Doug. God bless y'all. We got to get on fire for Jesus. Y'all want to just sit here? Or do you want to do something? We got to get on fire. I did something I ain't never done before. I come out of the little bit and walked up and down the aisle. So y'all start doing something y'all ain't never done in a while. Get on fire for Jesus and start telling people about Jesus. Folks, if we don't, we're going to die like the church of Ephesus died. That's what he told them in Revelation. He said, if you don't repent and do the first works, I'm going to remove your candlestick. Well, none of this in the notes. Y'all get the notes next week. How about that? And Melissa and Miss Frida and them come. The instrumentals come. We're going to have an invitation. I'm going to talk about all seven churches, but I didn't have time. We'll do that later. Amen? What well, Folks, really, seriously, what you going to do? What's it going to be like? I mean, I'm being real. Y'all got to be real. Are you saved? That's the number one thing. Are you saved? If you died right now, would you go to heaven or hell? And if you don't have that situated, you got to get that situated first and foremost. Don't play the game. I'm tired of playing the game, y'all. I'm ready to get real. I don't care what the world thinks. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I love Jesus. And I'm going to serve him. And I'm going to preach his word until they go drag me down here in a coffin. What's it going to be? Christian, are you tired of playing the game? You left your first love. Plain and simple. You left your first love. You know how to know that? Because if you love Jesus like you say you love Jesus, this church would be full. We would have to go to two services if everybody showed up. You know that? I was thinking about that coming this morning. If everybody got on fire and everybody came, like, and, and all the Christians around here that are members of this church would come like they were supposed to, we would have to go to two services to get everybody taken care of. But we've lost our first love. He says, you better repent of that and you better start doing your first works, which was loving Jesus, or I'm going to remove you. What's it going to be? Repentance or removal? What you going to do? Let's stand as we have a hymn of invitation. What number are we going to sing? Page 201. 201. God's speaking to your heart. You need to come. You plan